Hey there, and welcome back to my channel. Today, we are going to dive deep into orthographic mapping, what it is, and how to do it. If you're new here, my name is Anna DiGilio. I was a primary teacher for 23 years, and on this channel, we dive deep into all things small group reading instruction. We deal with the tactics and tips and strategies for rigorous, streamlined, and effective small group instruction. So if these are the kinds of videos that interest you, please click that subscribe button and that little bell next to it so that you're alerted every time one of my new videos goes live. So before we get into what orthographic mapping is and how to do it with your students, I want to quickly just kind of address the elephant in the room, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So I have been a teacher for 23 years as I have mentioned. I have taught guided reading for 23 years, absolutely, for 23 years. And I have learned a lot over those years of teaching. And I have done a ton of research on reading instruction and how children learn to read. And lately, there has been a lot of kind of controversy or, well, it's kind of been going on for years, but they call it the reading wars. And there's some controversy re uh, re revolving around the science of reading and how the brain learns to read and the balanced literacy or guided reading approach. So what I wanted to talk about first before we start this video on orthographic mapping is where I stand on this subject. I believe in the science of reading. I believe that we need to think about how the brain learns to read. I believe in the science behind it. But I am having some difficulty with some of the narratives that are kind of floating around the uh, education world about guided reading and balanced literacy. And I wanted to address that before going into this. One of the main things I feel where the narrative is off is that guided reading or balanced literacy doesn't teach children the skills that they need to become skilled readers. And teachers are teaching strategies on to guess words revolving around the MSV uh, kind of techniques of teaching children to read. And I have to be honest, I disagree with that. Now, I've been teaching guided reading, like I said, for 23 years. Now, way back in the beginning of my teaching career, year one, we had a very, very heavy focus on phonics instruction. But yet, there was a, a lack of using good literature in the classroom. And then I moved schools and I went to a new school and they were about whole language. You know, teaching children to read, utilizing the books that they were, you know, that they offered us. And it was all about really using kind of that MSV format. And to be honest with you, I didn't truly understand the MSV system until about probably 10 or 15 years ago. I found it very confusing, to be honest with you. But I very quickly realized when I was teaching through the whole language approach that there were huge gaps in my students' learning because what were they supposed to do when they came across a word in a book that they didn't know? And that was what I started realizing when this the school that I was in that was whole language, whole language, whole language, and no phonics. I was like, well, how are they supposed to read the words on the page and attack the words on the page of a, of a book if they don't know how to do it? So to be honest, it was from that moment on that I said, okay, I taught my whole first year where there was just, it was all phonics and no, very little reading. It was just very skill-based instruction and very little reading and literature and loving to read. And then I moved schools and then it was all whole language where it was just books. There was no really skill building. And it was then that I realized that there needed to be a very, very uh, equal balance of both skills and great books and great literature and um, beautiful illustrations to help children really love to read, right? We want children to love to read. And if we don't give them the books to do that, they'll never have a love of reading. So when I have taught guided reading for the last 20 years, every single one of my guided reading lessons included phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, and phonics because I believe to build skilled and fluent readers they need the foundational skills to understand how to attack words they don't know when they come when they come to them in the books that they read so 
where I lie is in the middle between the science of reading and guided reading and balanced literacy. I believe there needs to be a combination of both, and I'll tell you why. I worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students over my career in, in, in teaching, and here's what I know. If a child, if I'm assessing a child and if that child comes in and they have a very solid understanding of their short vowels, they have an understanding of digraphs and diphthongs and, and they have a really solid understanding of phonics and sounds and phonemes, right? But yet there's a, an area that they're lacking in. For one particular student that I'll bring up is Christopher. He had a very he had very difficult time with understanding long vowel variants, you know, the AI and the AY and the IGH. He just had a really hard time with words like that. So here's my question I pose to you. His instructional reading level was around an M or an N, more so on the N side. That was his instructional reading level. So my question to you is, if he's reading on an instructional level N, should I give him only decodable books to read during reading instruction if he's reading on a level N? Or should I take each child for who they are and the skills that they have and the weaknesses that they have and instruct them with what they need? So if Christopher is having difficulty with vowel variants, I will use decodable readers and teach him explicitly how to attack those words with vowel variants using decodable readers. But should I only use decodable readers? Should I only use readers like this? I don't agree with that. And the science of reading basically says that, that you shouldn't use leveled books. Leveled books are bad. Leveled books shouldn't be used in the classroom. And I disagree with that. I believe absolutely wholeheartedly decodable readers should be utilized in the classroom to teach explicit skills that students are lacking in. But if a child is reading on a level L, M, or N instructional, I want to give them beautiful books to read and enjoy. And when they come to those words that they don't know and they're struggling with, give them the skill-based explicit instruction to solve the words. That's what I believe in. In my 23 years of teaching, I have never taught a child to guess words during guided reading instruction. So I don't really know where that narrative came from. And to be honest with you, it actually really upsets me. It kind of makes my blood boil a little bit because I've been teaching guided reading for a long time and I've never taught children to guess words. So I want us to look at this and say, let's take what we know about children and how they learn to read and look at the science and take the science and bring it into a great reading instruction that helps children be skilled readers, understand how to attack words they don't know, and love to read in the process. That's my goal as a teacher. I want kids to love to read when they leave my classroom, and I want them to be reading well. I want them to be fluent readers. I want them to be able to comprehend, and I want them to be able to look at a word they don't know and go, I know how to take care of that word. I know how to attack it and figure it out and solve it using the phoneme, using those skills I learned in phonological awareness and phonemic awareness and use those skills to figure out the words I don't know. So I believe in both. I believe in the science of reading, but I also believe there needs to be an equal balance of the two. So I wanted to just get my thoughts out there uh, around guided reading and balanced literacy and the science of reading. Again, I believe wholeheartedly in the science of reading. I've been doing it for years and years and years and years in my classroom. But in this education world that we're in right now, there's a lot of narratives saying guided reading is terrible and level books are terrible and throw them out. And it just makes me so sad to hear that because I don't believe in a one size fits all education and I never did and I never will. I have to look at the individual students in my classroom, see where their areas of weaknesses are, see where their areas of strengths are, and teach the children with what they need. That's what I believe in. Use the science. Use the toxic tactics and strategies that the science of reading is telling you. But also use what you know about your students in your classroom and what they need to become skilled readers. So I believe in a 
equal balance of both. Use the science of reading and use guided reading and balanced literacy when it comes to addressing the individual needs of your students. So that's me. I'm going to get off my soapbox now and we're going to jump into orthographic mapping because orthographic mapping has really kind of come onto the scenes over the last couple of years uh, with the science of reading and to teach children how to attack words. Now, I've been doing strategies like this for years. I might not have called it orthographic mapping because this vocabulary was new to me. Um, and I'm going to put a book up here. I read this book recently and it was excellent, but there are parts of it I don't agree with as a teacher. And um, But there are parts of it I think are excellent when it comes to teaching children the skills that they need to learn how to attack words and really understand the, the skills that they need to become fluent readers, right? So let's jump in to what orthographic mapping is how to, and how to do it in your classroom, all right? So orthographic mapping is the process we use to store words into long-term memory. This is a direct quote from David Kilpatrick's book. The words that students store are words that are automatically recognized on site without having to decode them sound by sound. When utilizing orthographic mapping, a reader is using the oral pronunciation of words that is already stored in his or her memory with accurate letter sequences. Now, David Kil Kil Kilpatrick believes that letters or graphemes are anchored into the pronunciation of words. And since these pronunciations of words are already stored in our long-term memory, it is because we learn to speak long before we learn to read. So that's just a quick overview of what orthographic mapping is so and, and why we should be teaching it this way. So now what I want to do is I want to go into depth on how you can do it in your classroom. Now you can do this activity with sight words, with vocabulary words, with words that students are having difficulty with as they're reading a book and you're noticing that they're struggling with any word, any word. This is the way to teach children how to bring it down to the phoneme level to really understand how these letters make these sounds and how these sounds make the words that they're struggling with. So, are we ready to jump in? Here we go. So this uh, little trifold I made for orthographic mapping is part of it, our guided readers, guided readers program. And it tells you step by step how to do this, but I'm also gonna teach you step by step now. So the first thing we're gonna do is you're gonna need a work mat for your students to work on. Now, I suggest using a work mat that has the exact same number of sounds as the words that you're utilizing in the beginning when you're teaching children how to map words. I believe you should use the exact number of uh, sound boxes that the words have because they're inexperienced with this. As students become more experienced with orthographic mapping, I believe you should use a work map like this where even if the word only has three phonemes, give them this map so they understand that words have different numbers of phonemes. But I would start with a work map like this because it's very systematic and explicit and having them just understand that, okay, these words have three sounds and start from there and then scaffold your instruction, all right? So the first thing you're going to do is a teacher is going to, you as the teacher, will say a word out loud to the students. For example, let's say that the, the teacher says, okay, boys and girls, we're going to focus on the word ship. Ship. Can you repeat that word? Ship. Ship. Now what we're going to do is I want us to say each sound you hear in the word as you tap the table. Let's do it. Sh, I, p. Good. Let's tap our arm. Sh, I, p. How many sounds do you hear in the word ship? Sh, I, p. Ship. How many sounds do you hear? We hear three sounds. Ship. Sh, I, p. Ship. 
Now that we know there's three sounds in the word ship, I want you to take your counters. Now, these can be these little count, these little math manipulative counters. You could use these little foam counters that you have for math, the two-sided counters. These are just the same color, but you can use the double-sided. You could use any manipulative you have for this part of the activity. You could use those little target erasers. Whatever you have to have students touch, something to move them and focus on the sounds. We want it to be a tactile activity. So we know that ship has three sounds. So we're going to take three counters and we're going to put them in our boxes on our work map. So we know there's three sounds and we have three counters and we put them on our work map. Now you as the teacher will write the word you're going to make. We're going to make the word ship. We're going to make the word ship. Okay, boys and girls? And then you hide the word. Now what we're gonna do is, as we say each sound, we're gonna move the counters up into the circles. Let's do that. Let's sound, each, let's sound out each sound in the word ship. Sh, eh, p, ship. All right, great. Now that we know that there's three sounds, we've moved our counters. Now what I want to do is I want you to let's write the sounds that we hear in these boxes. So let's think about the first sound in ship. Shh. What letter or letters makes the shh sound? Who knows? You could be doing this in a small group or a whole group, however it is that you're doing it. What two letters make that sound or what letters make that sound? And someone hopefully will say SH, very good. And you'll say correct. SH makes the shh sound. It's a digraph. Everyone say shh. S and H make a different sound. It doesn't say sh. It says shh. So that's the first sound you hear in ship. Now let's think about the second sound. What's the second sound we hear in the word ship? Shh, eh, eh, eh. What letter makes that sound? I, good, let's do an I in the middle. Shh, eh, what's that last sound? P. Shh, eh, p. Don't say p, say p, p, p. What letter makes the p sound? P, very good, let's write the letter P. Shh, eh, p, ship. Good, let's see if it matches mine. Good job, it makes the word ship. Great work. Notice that boys and girls, the SH made one sound and because it made one sound, it's in one box. Good job, let's try another word. That's how you do orthographic mapping. Now, another suggestion I have is these little poppers are all over dollar stores and they're really great for um, bringing words down to their, their uh, individual phonemes. So you could also put one of these in every student's book bin. You could have them at your guided reading table. You can have everyone have one of these little ones in their desk. There's so many different shapes and colors and oh my goodness, there's so many of them. But these are really great for that tactile experience with um, uh, using orthographic mapping and bringing words down to their individual phonemes. So all they do is instead of doing sh, ip, or sh -ip. you could have them do it right here on the popper. Sh -ip. How many sounds are in that word? They, they just push down those three little bubbles. Sh -ip. Ship, there's three sounds. So these little poppers are great for that tactile experience with bringing words down to their individual phonemes. So this is exactly what uh, orthographic mapping is. It's really a learning how to attack words at the phoneme level. And D David Kilpatrick said in that book that I showed you earlier is that children need one to four exposures doing activities like this before the word becomes into their sight vocabulary. Words that they automatically recognize on sight. It takes one to four exposures for children to know the word by sight. Now, another, again, when your students get really good and, and they have a lot of experience with this, with this uh, 
a strategy or tactic for really breaking apart words down to their phonemes, I suggest moving on to a more uh, a, a, a more difficult work mat. So this particular one is a work mat that has six sounds, but that doesn't mean it has to be a word with six sounds. You could still do a word that has three sounds or four sounds on this work mat. But I suggest starting with this when they're inexperienced in orthographic mapping. So I hope that gives you a, a good understanding of how to map words, how to do it. Use a tactile um, part to experience this activity and this strategy because it really will help those students that need that tactile experience to learn something. So using your counters, like I said, or any type of manipulative, a popper, these are all great for bringing words down to their individual phonemes. And again, we want to make sure that we're, we're connecting the phonemes and the sounds to then bringing it to the letter level, right? Or the grapheme level. We want to focus on sounds first and bring it to the grapheme level. That is how students can really understand how to be, uh, how to attack words that they come to that they don't know and really figure them out. So this is a great way and a great strategy of, um, learning how, learning the initial or, I'm sorry, individual phonemes and words, and then connecting them to the letters or the graphemes that match those phonemes. And that's basically what orthographic mapping is. It's really simple, very easy to do with your students, and it's a really great process to do during your guided reading instruction when you're teaching sight words or high frequency words or vocabulary words that they're, that they're going to come to if you're gonna do any kind of pre-teaching or front-loading with your guided reading instruction. This is a great way to, to take some of those difficult words that they might see in the book and map them so they become, and as they have those more exposures, it, they will become part of their sight vocabulary. So that's it. That's what orthographic mapping is. It's super simple, but it's a really powerful strategy to help children learn how to attack words at the phoneme level and then connect them to the graphemes that match the phonemes. So I hope that helps. And again, um, I, as I said on my soapbox in the beginning, I believe in the science of reading, 100%. I believe in doing strategies like this to help our children be skilled readers. But I also believe in a balance, a balanced approach to teaching literacy. Like I said, I believe leveled readers need to be part of your reading instruction. And I also believe that decodable readers also need to be part of your guided reading instruction. Both of these things, along with orthographic mapping and really having students understand phonological foundational, phonological awareness skills that are foundational for reading to happen. I believe all these things are part of balanced literacy and guided reading. I've been doing it for years in my classroom. So that's kind of where my difficulty comes with um, this new, the kind of reading wars that are going on. You know, I understand that maybe people don't believe in the MSV technique. And like I said, I found it very, very confusing for very many, many, many years. So I really only utilized it when I did assessments. I never really utilized it during small group instruction because I just, I found it difficult to use. So I always brought it back down to phonics and phonemic awareness. That's how I taught my children to read. And in all of my years of teaching, all of my years of teaching, especially the last 10 or 12, my students always left my classroom reading on or way, way, way above grade level because I believe there needs to be a balance of skills and strategies that you utilize in your classroom to build skilled readers. So I hope this helps and I hope you could bring this into uh, this strategy of orthographic mapping into your teaching and I hope you found this helpful and again I definitely suggest you reading that book by David Kilpatrick because I think it's great but I do think there are parts in it I don't agree with but I still think it is a great great book so again I hope you enjoyed this video thank you so much for watching please if you're new here subscribe and click that little bell next to it so that you're alerted anytime one of my new videos goes live and please leave me a comment below let me know if you try this strategy out with your students. And again, don't forget, Guided Readers has all of these tools and tactics and strategies built into it, along with all of your thousands of level readers, hundreds and hundreds of decodable readers, and of course, our entire 
phonological awareness with ease program. All of that is part of Guided Readers because Guided Readers is a structured literacy program for guided reading instruction. So again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.